Well, good morning, everybody. It is a delight to welcome you to our online service of the word at St. Stephen's this morning. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we're looking forward to worshipping together, to digging into God's word and to bringing the needs of our world and our nation and those we love before our loving Heavenly Father this morning. Uh, Madeline and Paul, um, as many of you may know, are away on holiday. Um, so we are um, sending much love to them and hoping that they are having a real time of rest and restoration together. A couple of things to make you aware of that are coming up in the next week. Um, on Wednesday evening, there's the next um, in our series of Holy Spirit seminars with Phil Gaisley. And that's at 7.30 on Zoom. So um, you're welcome to join us there. And on Thursday evening, the 13th, at seven o'clock, we are having an Ascension Day service in partnership with Peter Mancroft. Um, and you'd be very welcome to join us at St. Stephen's for that. So now as we come to worship together, let's quiet our hearts and invite the Spirit of God to meet with us this morning as we gather as his people. The light and peace of Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. The glory of the Lord has risen upon us. Let us rejoice and sing God's praise forever. And now we come to a time of confession. Jesus Christ, risen master and triumphant Lord, we come to you in sorrow for our sin and confess to you our weakness and unbelief. We have lived by our own strength and not in the power of your resurrection. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived by the light of our own eyes 
as faithless and not believing. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived for this world alone and doubted our home in heaven. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. And so may the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And a prayer for the day. Risen Christ, by the lakeside, you renewed your call to your disciples. Help your church to obey your command and draw the nations to the fire of your love, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you would do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There is a lot of depth and application to be found in these very familiar words, and one could spend hours and hours pondering over these things. There were, however, a few important words or thoughts in this passage which stood out for me. The words abide, love, joy, complete and chosen all stood out. You may well have other words that spoke to you. I'm going to just briefly explore some of these and look at what they may mean for us for today. In Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 10 we read this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. It's important as we uh, look at the John passage that we hold this truth in our hearts and minds. Our salvation is not based upon our performance, but is firmly based upon his grace and mercy and the finished work of the cross. So may I suggest to you that where it talks about abiding in his love and keeping his commandments, it's not so much about gaining salvation, but about how best to live out salvation now that we have it. About being fruitful. Notice that in both scriptures, the idea of being chosen or created for purpose is very central. We're not just randomly chosen, but chosen with purpose. And that purpose is to fulfill God's will and and to reveal his love. And we do this best by willingly laying down our agendas, our plans, our purposes and following his. As we live to serve him and others, God is, is glorified and his ways and love is made known. It's as we obey him and serve him that we can abide in his love. The word abide here is meno in the Greek. It carries these meanings to remain, to live in, to be held and kept, to continue, 
to endure, to remain as one. It's interesting how even in this list of actions to be carried out by us, there is action on God's side as well, to hold us and keep us. This is how Jesus lived out his relationship with the Father. One of the amazing benefits of doing so is that we can not only have joy and peace in believing, which is Romans 15 verse 13, but we can have it in abundance. We can have it in fullness. Wow, just amazing. I just want to look at the fact that joy is not the same as happiness. Joy is an internal empowerment from God. It's a state of being. Whereas happiness is rooted in happenings. So it can be unstable and, and dependent on, on circumstances. So the goal in all things is for us to be joyful, not just happy. Jesus goes on and calls us his friends because we choose to serve not out of law uh, or even out of responsibility. None of which are wrong, of course. They're really, they're really good things. But out of our desire to see him glorified, to see his purposes outworked. Let thy kingdom come, let thy will be done. In the same way as Jesus came to serve and reveal the Father, which is John 6, 38, the Father has entrusted Jesus with his purposes and Jesus was obedient Therefore, God always responded to his prayers. So, Jesus entrusts us with that knowledge and calling. And as we seek his ways and his kingdom, so the Father will give us those things we ask, because we are asking in line with his purposes and his will. Our obedience makes the way for his love, joy and peace to abound in us and to us. It's the demonstration of our love for him. We are saved by grace through faith. And that is not from ourselves, it's the gift of God. However, it is as we freely choose to love him and each other and to lay down our lives one for another, to lay down our agendas, that we can truly enjoy and demonstrate his love for us and to show the world that we are his disciples. Just a thought that uh, in Nehemiah 8 verse 10, it says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Well, if this is true, and it is, and as we see here, Jesus is saying that the fullness of joy is directly linked with our serving God and each other. There may be part of the answer for those times when we're feeling weak, when we're feeling powerless, or perhaps we're just not sensing God answering our prayers or, or, or you know, the heavens are as brass, things have become difficult and mundane. Perhaps the answer is to stop seeing our service as religious duty. Not to stop serving, because there is blessing in sacrifice, but to see our acts of service and kindness as being born out of love and to really choose to bless the ones we're serving, to seek their well-being, to seek their joy above ours. Because as we do this, then our Father will hear our prayers and pour out his love and grace to us in abundance. I want to finish by reading from Philippians and just show a video which I think you will love. But the video actually says it all. Philippians 2, verses 1 to 4. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition, but rather in, uh, in humility, value others above yourselves, 
not looking to your own interests only, but each of you to the interests of others. Amen. And so let's respond to what we have heard as Megan leads us in song.
let us affirm our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord God, lead us into a place of deeper community with you. Show us your way, teach us humility in your tender embrace. Lead our nation to your place of peace and reconciliation and anoint our government with a mantle of wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Thank you that you have led us through trials and that you now bring forward spring, warmth and new life. Let us mature in thankfulness for the things that we have missed as we have hibernated from the cold winter of disease. Lord, bless our times together, the river that ends the drought of hugs. Protect us as we go our tentative way to the beginning of a new season. Hold this city in your hands that her people would meet the needs of one another according to their ability, that we would learn new ways to consider creation, even bet that that is between the paving slabs. Protect us as we come together to celebrate in gatherings, especially in the newfound gathering of the Premier League. Bless the new members of the council that open the chamber doors for the first time this week, and let peace and joy be the virulent contagion that we find ourselves in this year. Lord, resolve for the sake of suffering to innocence, the oppression in Myanmar, Hong Kong, and the COVID resurgence in India. Lord, we place into your hands our world that we can do so little about. In Jesus' name, Amen. Merciful and loving Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom as we pray in the words you gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We continue in our journey through the Bible Project together. And uh, this week we're gonna be hearing of, um, about the angel of the Lord. So we're continuing in the series on spiritual beings. Enjoy. So, in the Bible, reality is made up of two overlapping realms, the heavens and the earth, our space and God's space. And while life here on earth may seem ordinary, sometimes we can encounter heaven right here in our own realm. Yes, this happens a number of times in the Bible. And when it does, we often encounter a fascinating character, the angel of Yahweh, or in most translations of the Bible, the angel of the Lord. Now we've talked about angels. They're spiritual messengers who perform missions for God. But the angel of the Lord is no mere angel. How so? Well, every time he appears, he's described in a way that's purposefully puzzling. And it leaves you wondering, was that an angel sent by Yahweh? Or was that Yahweh himself? What do you mean? Here's one of many examples. In the book of Genesis, there's a story about Hagar, Abraham and Sarah's runaway Egyptian slave. And we read this. The angel of Yahweh called to Hagar. But then this angel speaks as if he is Yahweh, saying, 
I will give you many descendants. And then Hagar responds and says, you are God who sees me. So the angel of Yahweh is Yahweh, but that can't be. In the Bible, you can't see Yahweh or you'll die. Yeah. So this story and others like it are inviting us into a paradox that Yahweh is above all, inaccessible to us. But sometimes he reveals himself to us in ways that we can see and understand. And that's where this character shows up. He's Yahweh made visible to us. Yes, distinct from Yahweh and also Yahweh. This is very similar to other biblical stories about prophets who get a glimpse into God's space, like Isaiah, Ezekiel, or Daniel. And what they see is a glorious human figure on a throne who's called Yahweh. So the one on the throne and the angel of Yahweh, this is the same person. Exactly. Watch all this come together in the famous story of Moses and the burning bush, where we read, The angel of Yahweh appeared to Moses in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And when Yahweh saw that Moses stopped to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush. So this person in the bush is called the angel of Yahweh, then Yahweh, and then God. And then later in the story, Moses learns that the figure in the burning bush is the one leading Israel out of Egypt in a pillar of fire and cloud. And that's the one who later takes up residence in the tabernacle. The tabernacle, this is the throne room of God himself. You got it. The angel of the Lord is the royal glory of Yahweh appearing as a human. Now, keep all this in mind as we start talking about Jesus. In the opening of the Gospel of John, we're told that from all eternity, Jesus was with God and was God. Distinct from God and also God. That's the same paradox we saw with the angel of Yahweh. Right. And then John says that God's word became human and set up a tabernacle among us. The temple presence of the invisible God. Exactly. Now check this out. There's a story about when Jesus took three of his followers up to a mountain and his true identity was revealed. He was transformed into a glorious human figure. Okay, I see what's going on here. So the angel of the Lord was God appearing like a human and Jesus is God now become a human. Yes. And notice this. In the New Testament, no one ever uses the phrase angel of the Lord to describe Jesus. Why not? Well, they wanted to avoid the idea that Jesus was merely an angel. For them, Jesus was Yahweh God become human in order to fulfill his ultimate mission to fully reunite heaven and earth once and for all. May Christ, who out of defeat brings new hope and new future, fill you with his life. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah.